Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs, and it's my pleasure, as always, to welcome you to the Yiddish Book Center's virtual theater for tonight's program, Two Tribes, the story behind the graphic novel with Emily Bowen Cohen. Before we get started, the usual reminders, your video will be off and your audio muted throughout the program. You may send questions via the question panel at the lower right of your screen. We ask that you keep questions short and if you could refrain from comments so that we can try to get to all of the questions this evening. I'm delighted to introduce Emily Bowen Cohen. Emily creates comics that explore intersectional identity. She is Jewish and a member of the Moskiki Creek Nation. She uses personal experiences to tell stories that examine contemporary American and Jewish culture. Emily grew up in rural Oklahoma. Her father was the chief of staff at their tribal hospital, and her mother is a, quote, nice Jewish girl from New Jersey. When Emily was nine years old, her father passed away, and she was separated from her Native family. A decade later, she returned to Oklahoma for a bittersweet homecoming. She graduated from Harvard University and currently lives in Los Angeles, California with her husband and their three Native American Jewish children. Welcome, Emily. Hi, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for a wonderful book. Looking forward to your thank program. You. Thank you. <laughs> well, if I could, I just wanted to first take a moment to praise the Yiddish Book Center. Um, I was at the phenomenal new exhibit, Yiddish, a, a global culture, and the show really highlights the breadth of categories covered by Yiddish literature. And I personally found it incredibly moving that there was a Yiddish book there written about Native American communities. Um, there's just so few places where Judaism and Native American culture intersect. Um, and the Yiddish Book Center is one of those. So I just wanted to urge everybody here to continue to support the center so that we can ensure a vibrant future for Jewish people of all different backgrounds. And thank you so much for being here tonight. So I just wanted to say um, a little bit about my book before we get started. Two Tribes is a graphic novel. So it's got pictures, don't be surprised. Um, it's about a girl who, like me, is Jewish and Native American. Mia uh, is 12 years old, and she gets fed up with her Jewish mom and new stepdad. So she steals her bat mitzvah money to want to run away to her Native American father in Oklahoma. And in the process of this big adventure, Mia learns how to reconcile both parts of her identity. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how my real life inspired parts of the book. The book actually started as a memoir. And um, during that early stage of the writing process, I realized I had to be really vulnerable. And to do that, to create an authentic personal story, it really forced me to investigate some kind of painful parts of my past. And then once I decided to write the book for a younger audience, the graphic novel is for um, eight to 12 year olds, which is called middle grade. Um, once, once I decided that, <laughs> then I had to simplify all of the complicated discoveries I had made um, so to reach that audience. So I really had to drill down on the essence of what I wanted to say. So tonight I'm gonna share some of the thoughts that evolved during the process. So give me a moment here to share my screen with you all. Okay. This is the cover of the book. Okay, so like Mia, as we've as, as you've heard, I'm a member of the Muscogee Nation. Uh, my family on my father's side, you can kind of see pictured here, are indigenous to the east coast of well, what we now call the United States. We used to be called the Creek Tribe, so that might be more familiar to you. 
My family roots from my mother's side are Eastern European, we're Ashkenazi Jews. My maternal great-grandparents emigrated to America from what is now Poland and Russia. And though they may appear very different, I've found that my father and mother's family histories share similarities. For example, they were both forced to move from their original homelands. Specifically, my maternal grandmother's family was from Odessa, so that meant they were Litvak. My grandfather's side was from Poland, so that meant they were Galicianer. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we have experts here tonight, so <laughs> um, please let me know later if there's something more specific. My grandmother told me that Litvaks and Galicianer from her era did not mingle. Um, Litvaks thought Galicianer were, forgive me, uneducated zealots, and Galicianer thought that Lit Litvaks were soulless snobs. However, my grandmother, Marjorie Braylove, and my grandfather, Irv Horowitz, married nonetheless. My grandmother told me true love mattered over all else. So when I was younger, I kind of felt like it seemed like a mixed marriage for her for the time. Um, and I can't help but feel like her own experience of falling in love influenced her own view on mixed marriages. She supported all four of her children's decisions to marry outside of Judaism, including her oldest daughter, my mother, who married into a family that appears to be very different from her own. As citizens of the Muscogee Nation, here's the arrow pointing to my family side, my father's uh, roots are found right here in the United States, but they were also, they also faced a forced removal. When first encountered by Europeans, my tribe was living in the southeastern part of the country, what's now Georgia and Alabama. And in 1833, 10 years before my Litvak family emigrated from Eastern Europe, Andrew Jackson passed the Indian Removal Act. And that's when the so-called five civilized tribes, of which my nation is a part, um, were forced to leave their native lands on the East Coast. Native American tribes in the eastern part of the country would be relocated west of the Mississippi. My paternal great-grandparents were relocated to what's now Oklahoma. The process of removing my tribe from their original land became known as the Trail of Tears, as many of you probably know. My maternal great-grandparents also faced exile. They fled pogroms in Eastern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. Well, but why am I even talking right now about my great-great-grandparents and my great-great-great-grandparents? Um, I really felt the need to go back to my ancestors because the way that I learned the story of my family history had a very profound effect on me as a young person. When I was in my uh, tween, I guess you say now, or teenage years, and just beginning to form my identity, I didn't have access to my Native American family. So I looked for answers in books. Mia, in Two Tribes, you can see here in the panels, also seeks answers about her heritage in books. Like me, she doesn't have access to her Native family. She lives really far away from them. And unfortunately, what's available to her is a popular book about a girl who is abducted by Native American tribe. Um, we call this an Indian captive narrative. Uh, and an Indian captive narrative, which was, I believe, one of the most popular forms of publications for its time for a good 200 years, it participates in 
uh, they each participate in a, in a certain narrative, which about Native Americans from the past. Um, they tell the story of usually a young blonde girl who is stolen from her family by a Native American tribe and has to go and live with them and eventually learns to come back away from the tribe, um, you know, redoubling her, um, redoubling her feelings that Christianity is sort of the right way to go. Um, they are different, they have some differences, but they all kind of participate in this narrative that Native Americans um, are savages who have to be, who the government needs to be, who the government needs to protect pioneers from. So I really wanted to show the outsider perspective from which these books are written by drawing the book panels as stereotypically as possible. Mia is learning about her history in a really outdated way from people who have a certain message they're trying to send. So I'm kind of using my cursor here, if you can see it. Um, you can see I drew the panels of the pages of the book she's reading. Um, all of the Native American characters are wearing buckskin and feathers, and they're living in teepees, which is um, which is some ways that Native Americans dressed, but not all tribes did this. But I wanted it to be just like the most um, motion picture kind of version of what a Native American looks like. So reading this book, here's another page from the book within the book, Mia can get the idea that ancestors, that her own ancestors are strange and scary. Um, but even if she didn't pick up this particular book, she would still be growing up indigenous in a country that wanted to destroy her ancestors at one part, at one point. When you're Native American, even the history books written about you, your people can be painful. I remember learning about US history as a child and um, sort of, and feeling kind of like the message was that my own ancestors were savages or that they were, um, you know, kind of the big losers um, in the story of the United States history. And I wanted to include this in two tribes because I really believe that's just part of part of the part of how you grow up when you're native in the United States. Okay, so back to the family tree. After both of my families, my ancestral families were displaced, they all rebuilt their lives and communities in their new homes. However, my maternal grandparents and my paternal grandparents had significantly different experiences after they were displaced. Um, my Jewish grandparents, they're here. Um, they could really participate in the American dream. They were able to work hard, build homes and support growing families. And this was a lot more challenging for my paternal grand great grandparents and grandparents. In their new home in Oklahoma, to put it mildly, the system was not built to, let's say, accommodate indigenous success. Native Americans were denied access to well-paying jobs. And my grandmother herself was sent to an Indian boarding school that taught native students skills as manual laborers and um, domestic workers. There really weren't many other options. However, my Jewish grandfather, he benefited from the GI Bill. Um, he went to Harvard after the war and after he graduated, he was able to secure a low rate mortgage. So my grandma, my mother grew up in a big comfortable house in New Jersey and my grandmother um, on my dad's side, unfortunately, raised my father by herself. They lived in a rented home in rural Oklahoma with no running water and an outhouse, which was not a wholly atypical way for a single Native woman to, to live at the time. 
So how did my parents meet? This is always a question I get. <laughs> my father my father was from a forgotten part of Oklahoma and my mother was from a bustling suburb in New Jersey. Their paths crossed in a very American way. Despite, despite the pre prejudice that my father experienced growing up poor and native in Oklahoma, he went to college. He was the first person in his family to go. Um, he went to the University of Oklahoma to get a degree as a pharmacist. At the time, Harvard University was looking to increase the diversity of its student population. It was about 1969, right around the uh, civil rights movement. They recruited my father to go to the medical school. My mother was also in school near Boston. She went to Wellesley. And she had a roommate who was a Pueblo, which is um, to say Navajo woman. So my mother's roommate invited her to go to a native student's mixer. And my parents met at this party. I actually, since I've started doing this talk and my mother has, has listened in, she's corrected me. The native student mixer was the story I got when I was little, but apparently it actually was um, a meeting to to organize for um, American Indian rights. Uh, so it was like an American Indian movement meeting or something in Boston, which is pretty cool. But um, I guess that was too complicated to share with us when I was when I was a kid. Okay, so now here's some embarrassing family photos. <laughs> These are my parents, and they had a baby while my dad was still in medical school. That's my older sister, the little baldy there. Um, then my father graduated from medical school and my parents had my twin sister and me, that's me. And my father finished his residency um, in New York. And this is the three of us when we were young. After he finished his residency, we moved back to his home of Oklahoma. My Oklahoma memories are really the beginning of my creating two tribes. And the comics that I'm showing you here were, um, these were really the first ones that I ever did. I really wanted to preserve the memories that I had um, from when I lived in Oklahoma. I was kind of obsessed looking back, at looking back and trying to decipher why I retained some memories and not others. Um, and these early drawings were my attempts at sort of trying to capture the texture of that part of my life. So this actually, this five and dime in the Crystal Theater, that's the main street of the small town where I grew up. After his medical residency, my father um, returned to uh, returned to do good work. He was going to be the chief of staff at the newly formed Creek Nation Hospital, which was a hospital that, that treated my tribe. And the hospital was in our small town, um, which was called Okima, Oklahoma. It is, it, it is the home of Woody Guthrie. <laughs> um, if uh, you go walk down Main Street, where the five and dime is, you can actually see that we have this big water tower that says, proudly that we are the home of Woody, Woody Guthrie. Um, it was a town that's really small. It's about 3,000 people. But the remarkable thing about it was that a quarter of the population was Native American. And they weren't just Native American. They were actually from my tribe. So my dad worked at the hospital. And he, the hospital was right down the street from my house. So we could walk from my house to my elementary school. And from my elementary school, we could see my dad's hospital right from the right from the um, playground. It was really a remarkable way to grow up. We were in the heart of what people call Indian country. It was really easy to feel Native American in Okima, Oklahoma. Uh -huh. It was much more difficult to identify as Jewish, as you can imagine. We were the only Jewish family in town. Um, we were smack in the middle of the Bible Belt. Uh, at school, even there, the division between church and state 
was like, let's put it mildly fuzzy. Once a month, the Bible man would come to my elementary school and all of us students would get out of class to go to a mandatory school-wide assembly. The Bible man would come and he would get on stage and he would say to us, did you memorize the last passage, kids? I've got toys for good Christian boys and girls. If you had memorized a passage from the New Testament from the last time he was there, he would give you candy and toys. It was fantastic. Uh, of course, it was a great day. Um, and I really understood this way of life because we lived near my father's family and they were religious too. My Native American grandmother um, was devoted to her Baptist church. When we would go and visit her, she would read me out of a big, beautiful, hardcover, illustrated New Testament. Um, and that was one of the really nice moments that we shared. So after the Bible man, um, I was, I, one time I remember I came home and I came home singing the songs that he told us. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And my mom could hear me singing from the kitchen. She said, what are you singing? You don't sing songs like that. We're Jewish. We don't sing songs about Jesus. Because we were surrounded by Christianity, my mother was forced into action. If she wanted us to have a Jewish identity, she would have to battle these Christian influences. My mother was pushed to remind us of our tribe. So in order to attend religious services, my mother and father bought a house in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, that was the closest place to us for a, um, a reform synagogue. And um, the house was beautiful. <laughs> Getting to Tulsa took an hour and a half. But once we got there, it was worth it. Everything was so much fancier than at home in Okima. Even the synagogue was palatial. This was a really different place from my small town. And going to Sunday school that first day, I really had to wonder, but can I, can it be that I really belong here? Well, I had good reason to wonder if I could fit in. Um, sometimes I like to write Hebrew school like it's a horror movie because <laughs> I was so nervous and maybe I should have been because like the city that these kids were from, um, they were fancy. Okay? I was told to get a seat in the back, open up my books, and these kids decided to tell me where they thought that I belonged. Did you see the way? She wears her pants, these two girls whispered. Psst, hey, Emily, why is your face so dark? It's because you're dirty. And then I could hear them laughing at me. Um, so that's an unfortunate way to start Hebrew school. <laughs> but okay, it did introduce some me, it did introduce me to something that I contend with for the rest of my life. Apparently, I looked different from the other Jewish kids. Um, and in Oklahoma, my tan skin was a tip-off that my heritage was unusual. Um, I was Jewish, but I was different. In my book, Mia contends with this as well. At a Shabbat dinner with her parents and rabbi, she tries to tell the grown-ups around her that the kids at school say she doesn't fit in. Mia knows that she's seen as different from the other students, but the grown-ups, they don't understand or are uncomfortable and can't really wrap their mind around what she's trying to tell them. And adding insult to injury, um, her rabbi at the table makes an Indian joke. Um, he says, uh, referring to the Talmud, um, it's lucky we have this all written down. Without it, we would be running around like a bunch of wild Indians. 
And it was really important for me to include that joke <laughs> in, in the book because that was an actual joke that I heard a rabbi say from the pulpit um, when I moved to Los Angeles 20 years ago. Um, and those moments are really damaging. Uh, I, I actually hoped that there would be fewer of them as, and maybe, and maybe hopefully there are, but as, as we've sort of, as it, it, it's 2023, but just the other night I was having a, we were having a conversation, my husband and me and my kids around the dinner table. And, um, I think, I think my husband was talking about how, you know, how Jewish people were, were really in, essential to the civil rights movement, which is absolutely true. And they pushed back on that with him because they too had had experiences like I had had and like Mia had had at school where kids pointed out that they were different because of the way they looked. Um, and, you know, it's really, once you've had an experience like that in a Jewish space, it's really difficult, I guess, to truly feel like, you know, there's solidarity. And um, just one personal bad experience can really override decades of such good work that the Jewish people have done. Um, so, you know, I have a challenge. I have a, I have a hard time kind of sharing this part sometimes with Jewish crowds, because, you know, especially now, because I'm like, we, we kind of need a break. <laughs> like, like I, do I have to really be so critical? Um, but it is really important to me to just remind people how important it is that if there's moments like this um, in a Jewish space, it's really important that people stand up and say something <laughs> and not leave it to the person who's been hurt or harmed. Because um, I can tell you that you know, it can make you feel really alone in Jewish spaces to be called out for, you know, just to feel like you're not part of the crowd because of your ethnicity or how you look. Uh, so as a young person, um, I experienced this sort of isolation in Jewish spaces. But um, I, I also felt kind of, I felt this distance as well from the native community. Part of my mother's insistence that we spend Tulsa, our weekends in Tulsa going to Sunday school and learning Hebrew was because my sister was about to become a bat mitzvah. Um, and I was almost 13. And um, we started going soon before so she could know the services. And um, we did celebrate her bat mitzvah at our synagogue in Tulsa. Unfortunately, just six months after that, my father passed away. There were... I'll just tell you. So my father, he died very suddenly. It was a brain aneurysm. So uh, my twin sister and I were nine years old. And there were so many conversations um, that I wished that I could have had with him as I was growing up. Um, and I really did get to have those conversations when I wrote Two Tribes. It's no accident that Mia's father in the book, this is him here, his name is Van, and that's my dad's middle name. One of my favorite passages in the book is when Mia remembers catch, catching tadpoles with her father. Um, we had a pond outside of our house in Okima where I did exactly that same thing. And to be able to recreate that moment in a book and live with that as I, you know, designed the scene and, and painted the um, lines was really, it was a, a really healing moment. So in real life, by the time my twin sister, Jenny, and I had our B'nai Mitzvah, we were living in Montclair, New Jersey with my maternal grandparents. My dad's mother, my grandma had passed away and um, we eventually lost touch completely with my dad's side of the family. So in place of a native community, what I then was greeted with in New Jersey was what I kind of like to think of as the myth of the American Indian. In Oklahoma, like I just knew I was native <laughs> because of who was around me. Um, but in New Jersey, I was often the only native person people had ever met. So instead of knowing 
native people from around them. What people who I met in New Jersey knew about was what they knew about Indians from movies, comic books, ad campaigns. And from all of these images, you know, they formed a picture of what Native Americans should look like and what they should wear and how they should talk. Um, and this is a myth that's impossible to live up to. Uh, Mia and her generation today, um, they're luckier. Uh, today, there are lots of more ways to see more accurate portrayals of Native people, um, from comic books to TV shows. Um, the stereotypical representation of Native Americans is really being updated. Um, I choose the Land O'Lakes box because, for better or worse, our little Native squaw lady is gone. Um, but there are also examples of Native culture being created by Native American people. And hopefully, I, I, I was excited that I got to update this slide to include what we now have available to us. So back to the book. Um, uh, even with all of these things, people still do have an idea of what a Native American should be. And Mia contends with this. She faces the same confusion that I did when people speak with so much authority about what a Native American person should do, what they should look like and what they should wear. Um, in the book, she has to answer a series of questions to sort of prove that she's a real Native American. And a boy at her school says to her, can you ride a horse? She says, no, I can't ride a horse. Can you shoot a bow and arrow? No, she says. Do you have a secret Indian name? No. And then he just assumes, well, then you're not a real Indian. And like me, Mia doubts herself. What does this mean to be a real Indian? And how can I say I am a real Indian? Like her, I ask myself that question as well. Um, and I thought if I can't live up to these things, I can't really say I'm a real legitimate American Indian. In my own personal life, um, this happened to me when I was in high school and I was sort of not sure of my native identity pretty steadfast in my Jewish identity. Um, and that's when I went to college. <laughs> and I met a nice Jewish boy. Um, and I married him. Um, he's Orthodox. So I became immersed in all things Jewish. I learned more and about Jewish traditions than I ever thought I'd want to. <laughs> and I spent most of my time in the Jewish community. Um, and my Jewish identity really was being fed all these wonderful traditions. I found a lot of comfort in the Hebrew words that surrounded me in Orthodox services. Um, and I could really wrap myself in all the Jewish rules and customs. If I wanted to, I could think about nothing else but these rituals all week long, all year long. Um, but, or and I should say, and Jewish practice, this kind of Jewish practice requires community. You have to interact with other people. And I find that was where I would, um, I wouldn't be able to be so cozy and wrapped up in my big fur coat of Jewish traditions because people would ask me questions at Shabbat lunch and holiday meals um, at, at synagogue. And they would ask me, well, for example, where are you from? And when I say I grew up in Oklahoma, that would often provoke a response. They'd say, Oklahoma, why would you go there? Do Jews even live there? And I'd have to respond as best as I could. I'd have to tell them, you know, or I felt I needed to like my dad's. And yes, it is a strange place to grow up as, an, as a Jewish person. Um, and then I'd explain my dad's American Indian, my tribe, the Muskogee Creek. They mostly live in Oklahoma now. Um, you're right. There's not a lot of Jews there. And every week it was the same. I had to explain myself over and over again because people are curious. And they like asking questions. However, um, it brought me right back to those questions um, about what it means to be Native American. And um, a lot of times they ask me questions I couldn't answer, you know, about my own heritage. And 
you know, I wondered why does this seem even so remarkable to other Jewish people? In the end, I just decided to give up. I decided in my Jewish life, I was going to deny that I was native at all. Um, I passed as just Jewish um, because it was a whole lot easier. When people asked me, I would just say I was Emily from New Jersey. And there were never any more questions after that. Um, however, eventually that led to some dark times. I found I just couldn't sustain passing as non-native. Even though my past history was so complicated, I really hated not talking about who I was. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it felt really kind of like a trauma to sort of erase that from myself. Um, and I decided that if I was going to live completely Jewishly, I needed to live completely Muskogee as well. I had to be a whole person. And um, I didn't, I wasn't sure how to do that. Um, but I came to the conclusion that I had to go back to Oklahoma and find my family. And that, like, that took a lot more confidence than and courage um than I than I realized um like Mia in the book I really felt very isolated and it I had to do something big and scary in order to um reconnect with my native family um but eventually I did screw up the courage to go um and um I went to Oklahoma to meet my my family who were practically strangers at this point and I was eating kosher food um I was not driving on Shabbat and I took my you know husband and my three little kids and um and I knocked on their door <laughs> I did tell them I was coming first but um but I'm happy to say um reuniting with my native family that day was really a wonderful experience this is a photo of some of my dad's cousins and their kids. When we went back, um, my family told me all kinds of stories about my dad. They also told me all kinds of things about being Native American, um, but they didn't do it in any mystical kind of big deal, new agey kind of way. They just, they just told us this is who we are and this is what we do. And um, their casualness I guess, and their willingness and openness and generosity in sharing it with me because it was it was my heritage too, was um, a real antidote to feeling like I had to live up to the myth. They really just embraced me for my native self, self and my Jewish self as well. Um, after all, they did know my mom and they knew that she was Jewish and that that's just who I was. So in the book, Mia also has a very moving reunion with her family in Oklahoma. Um, like me, she learns a lot about her dad and she learns a lot about her traditions. Um, in this page from the book, she's learning how to stomp dance, which is a Muskogee tradition at ceremonies and powwows. Her cousin here is wearing shell shakers, which are leggings that have cans or, or in the old times, um, turtle shells on them that would make a noise as a dancer stomps around. Um, and when Mia comes back home to LA, okay, first of all, you should know she does get into a lot of trouble because, you know, she's 12. She should not be on a bus by herself. It's, her mom's really mad, trust me. Um, but through that, she has an experience where it, it is a punishment and she has to go and she has to learn with the rabbi. And through that process of getting to learn more about her Jewish tradition, she also gains a better appreciation for her Jewish background. Again, just like I did when I went through Orthodox wife boot camp. <laughs> Diving deeply into both of her traditions, just like I found, really enhances her understanding of who she is. Oh, and I should also say the rabbi here, this is the rabbi of the wild Indian joke. He also, he learned something from Mia as well. So there's a nice moment of reconciliation. <laughs> so, so don't worry. <laughs> um, Mia learns to reconcile 
both sides of her identity by, by finding the connections between her two tribes. And in this panel of the book, Mia's whole family is gathered around the Shabbat table. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to tell you that I have done this in real life. My Oklahoma family has come to visit me in LA and we have all gathered for a Shabbat meal. Um, through the process of telling Mia's story and distilling my own into her life, um, I learned as well how to really become a, be a member of two tribes, just like she does. Um, and I also learned that there can be this path to harmony, no matter how divergent two sides can seem. So thank you guys. That's the end of my talk. And um, I hope we have some time for some questions. I'm going to stop my screen share. <laughs> Emily, thank you. Um, You're so a, welcome. What a wonderful story. Um, beautiful. Thank, thank totally. you. Thank um, you. So I do have a lot of questions and we'll just right. into those. Um, okay. When did your maternal grandparents emigrate to the U.S.? My, okay, I should say, I always get my greats and my great, great, greats messed <laughs> up. Um, so my grandparents were here. My maternal great, my great grand parents on my grandfather's side <laughs> my paternal great I don't know how we say it okay whatever see I'm getting my, my great parents. okay so I my my grandma's family came here in 18 they were early 1840 and then my grandfather's family emigrated here I think it, I think it was 1920 so they yeah so my grandparents family like really still had a sense of like the old, the old world <laughs> more than my grandmother's <laughs> side of the family. Um, okay. We'll get all of the questions related to dates. <laughs> out of the way. Oh no. The next <laughs> one is, um, this one should hopefully be a little okay. later. Um, okay. which is, um, <laughs> when, when did you attend elementary school and when oh. were your parents in college? I guess they want to sort of understand that in terms of okay. the challenges. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So my, um, father graduated from Harvard medical school in 1975 when I was born and my mother graduated. He actually had got pregnant with my sister while she was still in, at Wellesley. So <laughs> She graduated in 72. And then when was I in elementary school? Well, now I'm going to date myself. But so I was at an elementary school in Okima in 1980 to 1984. And then we moved to Tulsa. My father died in 1985. Or 1984. But yeah, December of 84. Um, Is that it? Yeah. <laughs> how does your twin sister feel about her identity? Is that something you can share? Yeah, sure. Um, my sister, Jenny, my twin sister. Um, how does she feel about her identity? I'm definitely the mm, person in the family who felt the most like drawn to reaching back out to my Oklahoma family. Um, um, yeah, I think our childhood, our childhood was a bit chaotic and a bit traumatic after my dad died. And um, it was really... I think I, I think I was the one who kind of took the reins in that. Um, my, since then, my twin sister has come and visited Oklahoma with me, which was really, really wonderful. Um, but she's less interested in exploring these identity issues. <laughs> so that's cool. Like, I'm the one who's doing it. I feel like sometimes that's always, there's always that person in the family who kind of like keeps the stories and all of that stuff. And I, I like doing it. So all the nieces and nephews, if they if they have any questions, they know who to call. <laughs> um, let's segue from storyteller um, and artist, obviously, yes. to this question, which is, um, what were some of the challenges of telling the story mm -hmm. via graphic novel? Oh, some of the challenges. Oof. Well, the very first challenge that I came up with, I mean, was that um, to tell a contemporary Native American child's story, you have to have cell phones. I mean, that's just part of life for them. Now I know from my kids growing up and um, 
to tell a story like that when so much of the way they communicate is through the phone um, poses a particular challenge of just like you have a lot of faces. Mm -hmm. And that's a really boring way of telling a story. That was right off the very first challenge that I faced. Um, and it was really important to me to have Mia on her phone, um, just to really underscore to kids her age that like, you know, Native Americans are in the world today and they do the same things you do. So they're on YouTube. Um, I mean, it's already dated the stuff I have in there, but you know, um, that was the first challenge that I had. Um, it was also, I mean, this was, it was also challenging. I really wanted to communicate how Mia looks at the world as both a Native American person and as um, a Jewish person. And um, that's a lot of layers of sort of history. Um, so that was more of an exciting challenge was how am I going to bring in how she sees, um, like when she's reading the book, she reads these things and she sees these scary stereotypical um, images. And later when she's meeting with the rabbi and she's reading um, Jewish Torah, Jewish Torah, <laughs> that's, when she's reading a Jewish story from the Torah, um, it's, she reads it as a contemporary kid. And so there's like little jokes about Jonah and stuff like that, you know? So that was a fun challenge. Um, that was a couple of them. I'm going to put a couple of different questions um, together because a few people are asking sort of what was your, what were your children's reaction to this? Are they curious about the, um, their past on both sides um, uh, and how you came to living a total Jewish life? They say total. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, how they, my children, my children responded to living a total Jewish life. How, how they what? responded to your, I think that's what they're asking in that question, how they, how your kids oh. respond, responded Ooh. to your choice to, ah. to live oh, a- Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. Got it. Mm. Well, <laughs> how did they respond? Well, I can tell, they're in college now and my, I have a son who's in high school. Um for better or worse, I did complicate things by bringing them to Oklahoma when they were kids. And that, I mean, that was on purpose. My husband and I, we really wanted to go as a family so that they could understand what, that they were Native American and to meet their relatives and to, you know, really be able to take that on as their, their own identity. At the same time, they, they were going to a Jewish day school, a religious Jewish day school. And um, so they faced the same challenges that I did, mm -hmm. um, going to, to Jewish schools. Like they were confronted with students in their class saying like, oh, you're not native. There aren't na Indians aren't alive anymore. Um, you know, just, they had to confront those things too. Um, in a good way, I guess, because, you know, they were able to like really take it on. I will say much to my husband's sadness, um, they are not jumping into a religious Jewish life. Um, and I think that's because, you know, like I said, they face this stuff that made them feel isolated from the Jewish community. Um, however, they, I'm not, okay. everyone's still growing. So who knows where they're going to end up. But I do have a college student um, who is um, both in the, both the, you know, part of the, what do they call it? She's helps running the Hillel she also helps running the Native American student group. So she's sort of the most of my children who has her foot planted firmly <laughs> and solidly in both parts of her identity. But, you know, they're working it out. They've got questions, but, you know, we're still providing them a lot of Jewish stuff. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see where they land. I mean, I think that that's one of the things, and, and I'm not sharing the comments, but I think that that's one of the things that resonates about the book in your presentation, mm. Emily, is do we ever really work it out and do we have the yeah. tools and this story really does mm. allow for discussion, conversation and consideration. So for that, many people are very grateful that you've shared this story. Oh, oh I'm so glad. Nuance. Um, wow. <laughs> so we have one person here, I guess um, I'll, I'll share. This is more of a comment, but interesting. I worked in, I worked for Creek nation for two to three years oh. and went to that <laughs> temple in Tulsa. We hey! always find some some yes! connection here. In our virtual <laughs> Do I know them? 
<laughs> I'll share their name with you. <laughs> okay, please don't. <laughs> uh, so uh, such beautiful art and visual storytelling and your presentation was captivatingly oh. narrated. I'm wondering how you feel about the full range of rituals you practice via both your mm. tribes. Are you back mm. to feel that cozy, warm embrace? And thank you so much. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, I have to say, I am i don't consider myself Orthodox anymore. Um Probably because my kids sort of felt like so much. We we actually left the Jewish day school world and went to secular schools. Um, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to say, yes, I do find that warm, cozy embrace. But I think I'm stepping outside of the very, very traditional way of doing it and finding my own way and my own people so that I can return to the cozy, warm embrace. A lot of that has to do with having found... Um, a community of Jews of color here in Los Angeles um, who have had similar experiences to me and my kids. And we can celebrate traditions in a sort of more non-traditional way, but a way that feels more like an embrace. <laughs> Wait, but there was another question. Um, that I feel. About the practicing oh. of sort of both traditions. Of, yeah. So your family. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned in the talk, my, my grandmother was really religious and the way that my Muskogee family continues to practice the traditional, uh, rituals, Native American rituals is through the church. And my mother, right from the beginning was like, you can't go to church. <laughs> I mean, even before we were going to Sunday school river, he was like, my children cannot go to church. Um, and that's really how they practice their Muscogee rituals. So um, I just don't have access to this. It's just not my, it's not my tradition. So uh, I do practice more cultural traditions. For example, we go to powwows. Um, we wear ribbon skirts, which is a traditional kind of way of dressing. Um, we have fry bread, which is a traditional native food. Um, but the really, I mean, I'm sure it's really cool. I, maybe at some point I'll be able to be welcomed into it but the real traditional traditional ways are through the through a christian church and, and through a christian lens mm -hmm. so you know i can't i don't think as a jewish person i can fully embrace that i don't know yeah Fair enough um i guess do you i'm sorry i have to read off the thing do you find similarities in um sort of how native americans and jews are perceived as others in certain Ooh. situations, they're asking, yeah. Hmm. Do I see similarities between how Native yeah. Americans and Jews are perceived as others? Oof. God, this is, that's a really hard question. Um, oh, God. In my experience, I mean, I've seen it ugly both ways. You know, um, a lot of people don't realize I'm Jewish. And in certain situations, I've heard, you know, awful things about, said about Jews. <laughs> um, and people talk about, not necessarily, I guess, natives, but like it's a more ignorance. I guess that's what it is. Do I see similarities? Yeah. It's like when I'm in places where people just haven't met Jewish people or places where people haven't met Native American people, um, which is unfortunately because people are so much in bubbles. And because Native American people have just don't, and Jewish people don't interact so much. Like, I guess that happens. Um, I guess the similarity is it's really a matter of people not meeting each other. Mm -hmm. Because anytime they do, it's like completely fine. <laughs> I mean, it's a little awkward sometimes, but like, you know, we get there, we get there, we can make it happen. Um, I mean, I guess the similarity is just that I think both people need to, both people, like we if we can all just kind of let our walls down a little bit, um, that is going to be a real step forward. And um, and to kind of, because I, I've definitely been in plenty of situations where people say things not meaning to be offensive, but are very offensive. And I think you just have to, I mean, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of, this has to happen a lot of times before you just sort of have to say, have a conversation where like that, maybe you didn't need to say it that way in both directions. But instead, I think we just sort of shut down and um, want to run away from the situation, which is because it's so uncomfortable, but uh, you just got to work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that, answer there. I think I'm going to go then from there. Um, 
to this is the last question, if I may. Um, first off, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Curious to know if you present this to students. Oh, yes, I sure do. I love doing school visits. I've done a bunch virtually and in person. And sometimes I do live drawing. Um, I've spoken to little kids all the way up to college. Yeah, definitely. I love talking to them. They're so great. <laughs> They always ask me the craziest stuff. It's great. <laughs> um, Emily, on behalf of the Yiddish Book Center, thank you for thank you. the presentation and for all you do as well um, and for Thanks. joining us tonight. Um, for everybody out there, Two Tribes is available at shop.yiddishbookcenter.org and wherever books are sold, fine books. Thank there you. we go. Um, thanks, thank you. Again, and we hope to see you back for a visit and keep writing. Love to. And thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye. Um, bye bye. I want to thank this evening's producer, Elizabeth Carteropoli, for all she does to make all of our programs happen magically. Um, tonight's program is part of the Yiddish Book Center's ongoing series of virtual and now coming back live public programs. I hope you'll join us on Thursday, February 8th at 7 p.m. for our next program when we present Inside the Parrot Salon, the engine room of modern Yiddish culture with David Mazauer, chief curator of the center's new exhibition, Yiddish a Global Culture. Check out our full calendar of events to see what's coming up both in person at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, as well as all of our virtual programming. We've got a lot on the calendar and more being added all the time. We hope that you'll consider a visit to the Yiddish Book Center to see our newly opened core exhibition, Yiddish, a Global Culture. The center is open to visitors Sunday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And when you drop by, say hello to me and to Elizabeth. We'll be happy to see you, not virtually, but in person. And I want to take a moment to thank all of our members whose ongoing support makes all of our ongoing work possible. Learn more about how you can join and support us at yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Thanks again for joining us and look forward to seeing you again on February 8th. Until then, be well and take care. Good night.